how's it going? I'm Lincoln Brewster, and I want to welcome you to Volume 1 of my Guitar Instructional DVD series. Thanks a lot for joining me today. I hope that this series is something that helps move your guitar playing down the road in a good direction. So what we're going to do is, actually over the last several months, I've gotten a lot of requests via email and when we've been on the road of specific things that people want to see in an instructional series. And so we're going to break those up into several volumes. But uh, on this volume, we're going to cover some of the core basics of what it takes to be an effective rhythm player and an effective lead player. So uh, fear not, I'll take these and break them down into something simple and uh, we'll be able to unpack a bunch of cool stuff today. So let's take a look at all the stuff we're going to cover on this volume. Improv philosophy, warm-ups and exercises, basic technique, my gear setup, and solos and rhythm parts from All To You, Everlasting God, Let The Praises Ring, Another Hallelujah, and maybe a couple more if we have extra time. So before we get started into the specifics of the songs and the parts and techniques, let's just make sure that we're in tune and on the same page. So I'm going to start with E and I'll just take you through each string. Let's go to A. Now on to D. And as you'll notice, I'm letting these ring out. It actually takes a second for the guitar to get pitched. So if you're looking at your tuner, it's always good to let those strings ring out a little bit to make sure that your tuner registers the note properly. There's G. And then B. and then high E. All right, now if everything's cool, it should sound like this. Now I'm gonna take you through some technique basics that I use, and we'll actually apply these in some of the warm-up exercises that I'm gonna show you. So first thing we're gonna start with is what we call alternate picking, and it's very, very simple to do. So if you watch here on my picking hand, alternate picking basically is downstroke, upstroke, downstroke, upstroke. You just alternate, hence the name. So uh, it just works like this. So as I'm teaching you some of the solos that I'm going to show you, uh, when I reference alternate picking, you'll know exactly what that is. Also, we'll do that in some of the warm-up exercises. Right now, I want to talk about two things. One's called a hammer-on and one's called a pull-off. And These are very simple to do, but again, these are important pieces of playing solos. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate this first one just starting with a downstroke on my picking hand. You can actually do a hammer-on from an upstroke, from a downstroke, or from a pull-off, which I'll show you in just a second. But uh, hammer-ons basically I'll start with a downstroke and then you're just going to press the note without actually doing any pick stroke at all so you can do an upstroke now a pull-off is basically the exact opposite of a hammer-on so again you can start from an upstroke downstroke or from a hammer-on so downstroke and then you just or you can upstroke or from a hammer on. So then once you get going, you start with a pick note. That's basically a succession of hammer ons and pull offs. So it's pretty simple to do. And you'll use those in, in different types of phrases, you know, if you're going. I'm kind of throwing in a bunch of different things in just that little riff. So. But I'll, uh, I'll take you through some of that stuff slower so you can really unpack it and try to get your head around it. Okay, so now that we've covered alternate picking, hammer-ons, and pull-offs, we get to move on to one of my favorites, which is vibrato. And the reason I love vibrato is because it really, really is a big determining factor in how the voice of the guitar sounds. And so um, this is really cool, and it's really endless in terms of the expression that you can use it for. So uh, when you think about just taking a note straight up, um, Let's just say you do a basic bend. Just hold it like that. If you add a nice vibrato, it helps sustain the note and just gives it a little different feel. And so vibrato, you're just going to move the string around like this. And different people have different sounds in their vibrato. If you do like a BB like a King vibrato, he tends to use that index finger and it's a real fast kind of... 
Now I tend to like a little slower vibrato that's a little bit deeper in pitch. So that type of thing. One technique you can use to help really get your vibrato in there is I, I actually use kind of a, I guess it's like a fulcrum pivot, but uh, I'll press my finger here against the bottom of the neck and then I'll just turn my hand like this. So I'm just kind of pivoting my finger like that. And it kind of gives additional strength to my finger so that obviously my finger, if I turn my hand, it's gonna pull down. And it's just, just gonna enable me to really dig in on the vibrato. So if you watch, if I play a, a, some kind of just a, like a blues like. See, I'm just moving this piece of my hand. I'm just pulling it down like that. Now, if you're doing vibrato, say, with your ring finger, one of the things you can do there is you're going to pull down like this, but you can kind of use your hand. Again, same type of idea. And this is it gets a little bit tricky, but once you get the feel of this, you, you'll go, ah, oh, it'll, it'll just come to life. So you're going to use the same thing. You're going to press your index finger right down there and keep that anchored on the neck, on the bottom of the neck of the guitar. And then grab the string there so you're still touching here. You're going to grab it with your ring finger. Then you're just going to pull down with all three fingers. See that? And that's like three times the strength. And you can just get these nice deep vibratos, lots of feel. So. Be much much harder if you were trying to do that totally isolated I mean like I don't even know if I could control my vibrato that way and uh, the other thing that happens is the strings will tend to ring out funny if you try to do that. it's a lot harder to do so and again even down there on the low E string look what's touching Right there, still got that anchored down there. Then I'm just pulling my hand down and bending my finger just a little bit. So that's something you can play with. And one of the things as we go through these techniques, I just want to encourage you to find your own thing. Find the things that work for you. It's kind of like taking the shopping cart technique, you know, where you pull it up to the shelf, you put the things in the cart that work for you, and then leave the rest on the shelf. So now I'll give you some examples of the way that I use vibrato. So um, uh, vibrato, bending, that type of thing. So Without vibrato, that wouldn't sound nearly the same. So a very, very important piece of the pie. That's why I was saying I like it so much. So, And uh, same thing when you get up nice and high on the neck, if you're going to play some lead parts that are real singy. And vibrato is just such a key part. Uh, so if you bend this note, you can just get that. Gives it a different thing. The other thing that it'll do is it'll actually extend how long you can hold the note. So that's a pretty cool thing as well. Now with vibrato, um, bending is a big part of that. And you can look at vibrato two ways. It's really just bending back and forth two different directions. And uh, when I do bends, sometimes I like to bend them just slightly out of tune for just a little additional feel. And uh, you can use some of the same technique that I, I was showing you with the uh, kind of fulcrum uh, with my index finger. Um, and then also, when we're bending with the ring finger, you can use those other fingers for support just to make the bends easier and you can get them a little more accurate. So if I do a bend, it'd be really, really tough, again, to do it with my ring finger this way. Real, real tough. But if you take these fingers and... Real easy. And then bends can go both up uh, or down, but obviously it's going to bring the pitch up, but you can do them in any direction that feels comfortable for you. I actually use a combination of both depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. So what I'd like to do right now is actually play a couple of licks with no vibrato and no bending so you can hear those. And then I'll use vibrato and bending to play those same licks and you can hear the difference between the two. And I think you'll hear the value of having good vibrato and good bending. So here's the first lick. One more time.
take that same lick and put bending and vibrato on it, and it sounds like this. One more time. So when you hear the term feel as it relates to playing, a lot of that's coming from vibrato and bending. Here's another lick with no vibrato, no bending. Very simple lick. And then you can do this lick, alternate picking, pull-offs, hammer-ons. But then if you add vibrato and some bending to it, it can sound like this. So it's just got a whole different flavor about it when you put those components in there. One more thing I want to talk about as a technique basic is slides. So this is real effective. Instead of just hitting a note and then using some vibrato, you can slide up to that note sometimes, which just gives it a little bit different flavor. You can also slide down to a note instead of just hitting down to it. So instead of just hitting that note, sometimes you can go. So I'm using a hammer on, and then a pull off, and then a slide down, another pull off, or you can pick them all. But making sure you're doing a little bit of that bending, like on this note here, I'm just pulling up just a little bit, just taking it a little bit out. So. So I'm just going to play for a second using some of these basic techniques that we've talked about. I'll use all of them in different ways. So hammer-ons, pull-offs, alternate picking, bending, vibrato, and slides. So now that we've covered some of the basic techniques that I use, I'm going to show you some exercises that will put those techniques into practice. The first one I'm going to show you uses alternate picking on the right hand, and then you're going to use all four of your fingers on the left hand to do a very simple pattern. And one of the things that players find a challenge, certainly I did as I was learning to play solos, is trying to keep my left hand and my right hand synchronized together so that when I strike the note, that my left hand, my left finger, is hitting the string at the same time that I'm picking. And if those get out of sync, it can make your playing not sound as clean and as crisp. So this is one of the exercises that will help with that. And as we talked about before, using alternate picking is an important piece of this exercise. It starts on F, which is the first fret low E string. And you're going to walk up chromatically. So F, F sharp, G, G sharp. And while we're doing that, if you look at the picking hand, we're using alternate picking on that string. Then we're going to repeat that on the A string, making sure to keep those alternate. So it's got to be down, up, down, up. Make sure you don't repeat two of those in a row. So down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. We'll go all the way up that way. Now what I like to do is instead of coming straight back down, I like to do a slide up to A and then walk down that way. So if we can take the last two strings of that phrase, so down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and then we're going to use a downstroke and slide at the same time. So we covered slides in the earlier section, just use that same technique. And then upstroke, down, up, down, up, down, up. We'll walk it all the way down. And 
and then you can just go up to the next note. So we'll cover the last two strings on the low section, and then we'll just keep moving up. So down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Slide up this time instead of sliding down. And then basically you can just keep that going all the way up the neck and all the way back down the neck. Just make sure if your hand gets too tired and you start playing it sloppy, stop and take a break. One thing that's very important as you're doing these exercises, especially as it relates to alternate picking, is play these at a tempo where you can play them accurately over and over again without making a lot of mistakes. It's kind of strange, but if you learn these the wrong way, you'll actually have to break a bad habit before you can learn a good habit. So it's best just to play them slowly and accurately. And something a, a guy told me years and years ago, he said, if you play it dead slow and accurately, speed will just be a byproduct of that. So when I first started to play this exercise, I think I was playing it about this tempo. So even though I was tempted to try to play that faster, speed just came as a natural byproduct of practicing it over and over at a tempo where I could play it correctly. So um, I didn't just wake up one day and play it as fast as I can play it now. It just took a little bit of time and some practice. So uh, if you work at it, you can eventually just get that speed going. So uh, I'll kind of increase the speed as I play this, um, and you can kind of hear what's possible if you work at it over time. Right now I want to show you a variation on that last exercise. It'll help us get a little more mileage out of that same technique. So it's very simple to do. What you're going to do is go up to the twelfth note of the phrase. So just count four notes per string. note. And then we're going to jump down to the fifth note of the phrase. So if you count up five notes up to the B flat, you're going to jump down to the B flat from the twelfth note. So slowly it goes like this. Down to B flat. And you're going to jump down stroke on the pick hand and slide up. Then go back to the fifth note. And then fifth note again. So obviously playing this exercise that way, you're going to get a lot more mileage out of it with pick strokes. The other thing you're going to gain from it is you're going to change strings going back down and back up. So it gives you a little bit more variety. And that's something that as we're learning the solos on this volume, you'll see that we do that. So we'll go back and forth between notes. So doing this move right here, dropping down in the middle of it is actually a helpful technique. And just refining this. And again, increasing uh, the sync between your right hand and left hand. exercise I'd like to show you has to do with bending and uh, it's very very simple to do so the basic premise of it is you're just going to give your fingers a good old-fashioned workout and uh, it's good to take each of your fingers and do this up and down the neck so the basic premise is this with your index finger and just do a different riff. And 
you get a little vibrato on that note. So wherever you can put that in, it's good to do it. And the reason I'm doing this, instead of just going, it's just a bit boring if you have to go all the way up the neck and all the way back down doing that. Same with this. So I tried to find a way to make it a little bit more musical. And one of the ways you can just take this over the top and make it a lot more fun is to play along with a drum machine or something. So I've got something pulled up here in Pro Tools, and uh, I'll play along with it and show you what I'm talking about. Makes it a lot more fun. When I think about general improv philosophy, I get reminded of this story that I heard a while back, and it was very, very cool, and it kind of sums up how I feel about improv. Um, the story it revolves around an engineering firm that had some problems with a bunch of their equipment, and they couldn't figure out what the problem was. None of their engineers could diagnose the problem, so they had to hire a guy from the outside to come in and try to fix their equipment. So after several hours of going through their gear, he narrowed it down to this one black box. And all he did was took out a piece of chalk and put a check mark on that black box. So he left, and then their engineers opened up the box, and sure enough, that was the problem, and they were able to fix it pretty easily. So when he sent the invoice in, the invoice was for $10,000, and so they were pretty shocked about that. So they said, hey, could you at least itemize the invoice so we know what we're paying for? And he said, sure, no problem. So here's what the itemization looked like when they got it back. It said, a chalk mark, $1. Knowing where to put it, $9,999. And I cracked up laughing. I thought, that's perfect. It's not so much being able to execute this stuff, but it's knowing when and where to play it. And so as we dive into some of the solos and some of these songs, not only do I want to cover the how you play, but also kind of my thought process behind coming up with those solos and making them a part of the song. I think that a guitar solo shouldn't just be a solo for the sake of doing a solo. Now, I know it's fun to do, but if you really check your heart and say, why do I want to play a solo in this song? Is it to add something great to the song or to show off your gift? And I'm a big fan of just adding something great to the song, saying something new, saying something different, and continuing to elevate the song to a new level. The first song I'd like to take you through today is the song Everlasting God. Now I'm going to show you the rhythm parts first, and then we'll jump over to the solo, which is a lot of fun. So the rhythm part approach to this song was very syncopated and something that also added a lot of size to the song. And there's two ways that you can approach this uh, when you're playing rhythm. You can use a muted technique where you just lay the palm of your hand against the strings. So instead of getting this effect, you get this effect. Using that muted technique where you lay your palm against the strings and make it real tight, just one note rhythm. And then to jump to that F sharp lick. Very, very simple. So, but keeping that tempo real tight with the drums is very important to making this sound nice and tight. So let me play you back the B section of the song with all the tracks on. And it goes with the chorus. So I'm going to solo up the primary electric track on this, just all by itself, that way you can hear what's mainly driving that B section. And here it goes. A little picking here. And that kind of builds coming out at the end, so 
Let me take you through exactly how to play that. The first chord in the B section of Everlasting God is a chord called a B over D sharp. And I'm going to show you a conventional voicing for that song that I think you can use in other places, even though we're going to use a different inversion for this song. So you would play the B chord on the fourth fret, starting on the D string right there. And then you'd throw the D sharp in the bass with your ring finger, sixth fret A string. Just like that. It's kind of a nice chord. Now the one we're going to use for this song is index finger, A string, sixth fret. That's the D sharp. And then we're going to play that B note with our ring finger on the ninth fret D string. Get that chord. Now, usually you'd use your pinky like that, but I'll show you why we're not going to do that in just a second. So that's the first chord. The second chord, you're just going to do a real simple slide up with your index finger up to the seventh fret A string. So just like that. And if you'll notice on that part that we listened to, it goes like this. It's like a high strum. Now, in order to make that strum ring out like that, We've got to put our pinky on the ninth fret G string, and that's the octave E. So, and one way to find the octave real easy, whether you're rooting on the E string or the A string, is just go up two frets and skip a string. So, if you're right there, seventh fret A string, skip the D string, go to the G, and then go up two frets. So, that works all over the neck. All right. So again, first two chords, and then there's going to be that. So what we're going to do is just put our pinky right there, ninth fret, G string, get the octave E. So and it rings out nice and clean. Then you repeat the first two chords, and then you're going to slide the E5 up to an F sharp 5. And again, that's just F sharp and the 5 note. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Same with the E5. All right, so. And there's a little picking pattern on this next chord. So you're going to put your middle finger on the 11th fret A string, which is a G sharp. And then you're going to put your ring finger on the 11th fret G string, and your pinky on the 12th fret B string, which is a B. All right. And that 11th fret G string is actually an F sharp, which is going to make the chord a minor 7. Okay? So as you're walking that up, that's the phrase. It's like a little picking pattern. So if you watch that nice and slow, then we're going to strum that next chord, and basically it's a different inversion of an F sharp major chord. Just like that. So you've got the F sharp on the A string, which is the ninth fret. And then you've got octave right there. And then we're just going to throw the third in. Right there. So it's really just a two note chord, but it's got an octave in there. But here's one trick that you've got to know when you do this chord. It sounds like that. We're skipping a string there. We're skipping the uh, D string when we're strumming. So you're actually strumming the string, but the technique I'm using is I'm muting it with my index finger. So see that? So only the strings that I'm pressing down on are the ones that are ringing out. And that D string just kind of gets muted when I strum. So. And I'll even show you the shape of that a little more clearly. Well, you can see how my finger's touching this string just slightly right there. Fretting that note, which is again ninth, ninth fret, A string with my index finger. And then I'm, but I'm muting that right there. So right there is where the muting is happening. So let me go ahead and play the figure up to that point. Again, just a little rhythmic picking pattern right there. So you're just going to move your pinky up the 12th fret on the B string. And that's called a sus. So if you ever see little sus on a chord, that's what that is. It's taking the third, raising it up to a four. All right? So. I'm going to 
going to go back to that E5 chord. And then you'll hear this riff there, which is a real simple little riff. Again, using that pinky on the on the E octave, ninth fret, G string. And then you're going to drop it down with the middle finger. See that right there? Okay, so you get a... And this is just a little tricky thing, it's not too, too hard, but um, it'll take a little bit of practicing. And when I was originally coming up with this part for this song, I had to, I kind of wrote this part and then I had to practice it a bunch of times to get it where I could play it fluidly for the recording, so... You're going to take your index finger right there, put it on the ninth fret high E string to get that. And then that same strum technique with that F sharp major chord. Now. And then you're going to do a build where we use a little bit of that muting technique that we saw in the verse with your palm on your right hand. And then we'll kind of open it up as we strum. So the ending of that phrase will go. the chorus. Okay, so the good news is the chorus of Everlasting God is actually the easiest part of the song to play. So let me take you through the chord voicings that I use and then I'll show you the rhythmic pattern. So the first chord is just a B5, but it's got both octaves on the B. So 2nd fret A string, 4th fret G string, 4th fret D string. So, And it's just a real simple, no dynamic change, just rhythmic pattern, 8th notes like this. All right, and that goes for two bars, and then we're going to go to an E5, but it's a different E5 than this one we use in the B section. This one's a real big sounding chord, so you're going to use low E open, 2nd fret A string, 2nd fret D string, which is the octave E, and then you're going to use 4th fret G string, which is the octave B. So basically you've got octave E's, octave B's, and then again you've got them on those two high strings. So it's all E and B. Nice big chord voicing. So that one's again. And then I just do a little walk up on the F sharp on the low E string, so it goes like this. That walks up to the next chord, which is the third chord, and then G sharp minor seven. Very simple chord to play if you use your uh, middle finger, fourth fret E string, ring finger, fourth fret D string, and your pinky, fourth fret G string. You get that chord. And we talked about that muting technique I was using earlier on the B section. You do the same thing here with your middle finger. So you're actually strumming the A string, but it's not making any sound. This is the only one that has a little bit of a rhythmic pattern to it. And you can make this your own depending on you know what you're hearing, but this is how I play it. Okay, one more time on that. Then back to the E5. Okay, and then I do a walk up, and you might hear this in the track. It's kind of tucked back in there, but it's kind of a cool rub against the bass because the bass stays on E. And I'm doing an octave climb like this. So it starts there, and then I do F sharp octave. Just like that. One more time. And then F sharp. G sharp. Sharp B. So like this. I'll show you that rhythmic pattern one more time. So here's the whole chorus. And it basically just repeats that two times. Okay, so now we're through the verse, B section, and chorus of Everlasting God. Now we can dive into the guitar solo. And I think that you'll find this a pretty fun solo to play. By and large, it's pretty simple techniques that I'll take you through step by step. And there's one spot 
where it requires a little bit more speed, but it's one of those spots that if you play it slowly and correctly, the speed will come over time. What I did on this particular song, I remember going, a guitar solo would fit well here. I listened through the song, and um, I had a friend one time just tell me, kind of let the song tell you what it needs. So I listened through, and at the end of the second chorus, I went, this song's begging for a guitar solo. So I listened through the section, and I tried to sing something along, you know, just what would fit in here. I like solos to be memorable, have some themes to them, and things that I can sing. So you'll notice that this solo starts with an octave B, about as low as I can get in the key of the song. So it, it starts down here. And then this solo is actually going to end almost as high as I can get on the guitar up here. So it really goes from low to high. It's got a lot of build factor to it, which I really like. So, and one other thing uh, before we dive into the part itself is pickup settings pretty important. So I use three different pickup settings on this song. Through the verse, B section, and chorus, I used what some people consider second or fourth position on the switch. So if you just take it to the bridge position right there and just move it up one position, that's gonna give you the bridge pickup and the middle pickup. So when I get to the solo section of this song, I'm actually gonna switch to the bridge pickup and then I'm gonna roll my tone pot down to about five. And the way that I've got this guitar wired is I've actually got the bridge pickup wired straight to the back tone pot. And what that does is allows me to roll off some top end and effectively boost the low end and mid range of this pickup, make it a little bit fatter. So let me show you these two sounds. So this is one with the bridge pickup, tone pot rolled back about halfway. Here's the same part with the pickup in the fourth or second position, depending on how you look at it, with tone pot wide open. This gives you that kind of bright, detailed, more spanky rhythm sound. So when we get to the solo, I've got to make that switch, and live I had to figure out a time to do that where it wasn't going to be real obvious and it wasn't going to hinder the part. So I chose to do it during the chorus, just before the end of the chorus. So. This is the second half of the chorus, and you can kind of watch this change happen. And then I'll start the solo already on that setting. So the first chord of the solo is actually index finger, second fret, A string, ring finger, fourth fret, G string, octave B. Remember we talked about move up two frets, skip a string, there's your octave. And then I'm going to use that same shape up to the fourth fret on the root, which puts me at the sixth fret on the high note. And whatever is more comfortable for you. Some people like to use their ring finger on octave. I like to use my pinky. So if you'll notice right out of the gate, the chorus of this song goes, You are the everlasting God. And so I decided to take that melody and apply it to the first part of the solo, just for some familiarity. And then I do a little variation where I slide up. So again. All right. So let me play that whole phrase up to speed. And if you'll notice, I'm using some vibrato on actually on both fingers on that octave. Now the next section of this solo, I'm going to take it up a little bit and just continue to build it in terms of the range. So I kind of start down here and moves to the middle of the neck and at the end of the solo we'll jump up top. So for right now we're going to cover the middle section. So coming out of that, one more pickup change and just flip that up to the neck position. And that's going to give you just a little bit different timbre, so a little more bluesy sound. So just watch me do that. One 
One more time on that. I'm going to do a bend. Now this is a pretty simple thing to do, but you're going to bend up here, and then you're just going to take your index finger and play the 12th fret E string right there. All right, then we're going to do a pretty conventional blues lick, but where it's phrased, it doesn't sound as standard as the lick actually is. If you remember that story I told you about, knowing what to put where actually can really have a big impact. So. So it's G string, 13th fret, ring finger, and then index finger. And we're going to use a pull off there with a down stroke. And then middle finger, 12th fret, B string. And then we're going to bend that up just a little bit, just to give it that little bit of flavor. All right. Slide down with the ring finger, D string, down to the 11th fret from the 13th. So that whole phrase. For the next section of the solo, this is a part that requires a little bit more alternate picking speed and a little more finger speed. But I think if I break this down slowly, with time, the speed will come. So. Uh, you're going to start on the 7th fret, index finger, B string, and E string. And this is called a barring technique, where you just press down on both of those at the same time to get that sound. Then you're going to take your middle finger and your pinky, and it's basically called a major third. And this kind of can have a bagpipe effect. So the technique here is this. Take that much. So it's down up. And you take your middle finger on the ninth fret, high E string. We do a pull off there. We talked about pull offs earlier, but. And then the next one, we're going to do the same move, but we're going to use our pinky on the eleventh fret, high E string, and again do a pull off. So the pattern is down up. Pull off there. And I'm actually doing upstrokes on those with the pick. So there's a little pattern that I've got going. So it's down, up, down stroke on the first pull off, and then an upstroke on the second one. That's what works for me, but again, you might find this feels a little bit different for you. Moving along in that section, there's a part that where this, the pinky actually goes up to the 12th fret high E string. And one thing I want to mention on doing these solos is these don't necessarily have to be note for note. They're fun to try to get, but honestly, I'll record solos sometimes and then I can't even play them note for note. It's just a take that I happen to get a certain way. So don't feel any pressure to do these exact. You just want to get the general essence of the solo. And uh, I remember having to learn a lot of the Journey songs when I played with Steve Perry. There were parts that I just simply played with a different style, obviously, than Neil Sean does. So I just had to listen and try to get the basic essence of those solos. And knowing that the people we were going to go play for wanted to hear the original solos as close as possible. So I just did my best. But ultimately, on some of the fast licks, I just had to make them my own. So this one could have a bunch of different variations to it and still, in essence, sound like the same thing. So to keep moving on in this lick. So that's kind of the uh, bagpipey kind of thing. It's uh, pedal tone, actually, is what it's called. So you got one consistent note through there. And you're going to kind of walk these up. So. So 
that whole phrase, and I'll just play the whole thing very slow. Another technique that I use in there that involves hammer-ons and pull-offs at the same time, basically, uh, or one after another. So it's a little kind of a trill, and uh, it works in this major third. You can do it with an upstroke or a downstroke. So that's after this. So again, real slow. So that whole phrase up to speed. Okay, so the last part of this solo is going to keep climbing up the neck, and we're going to do some bends, and we covered those earlier in this volume, uh, bends with vibrato. And these are just straight bends, but they got to have a lot of that vibrato and a lot of feel to them to get the right thing across. So coming out of this section, we're going to go up to the 17th fret. Just bend that note up and give it a nice vibrato. So one thing I do is I do a downstroke, and it's actually, this is what I call a rake downstroke, and you'll probably hear me doing this a lot, but I'll kind of do that going to the note, and it gives it just a little more angst, I guess. So instead of just, and I'm using that muted palm technique on my right hand over here, where this is kind of resting on the bridge. So. And then I use an upstroke to keep the note sustaining a little bit longer. So the phrase goes, da, da, it's kind of a double hit. So. And then a little melody here. So again, a rake pick. Alternate picking. And I do that starting with an upstroke. So. And then we're going to go up to the 19th fret, bend, whole step. And then to the 21st fret, another bend on the B string. And you'll see me again using that index finger anchored on the bottom of the neck and using my other fingers to support that bend. Okay, that's a tough one. And give it some good shake. And there's one last thing that I want to show you. Um, as you get way up high on the neck, you can't really, it's a little tougher sometimes to use your index finger to support those bends. But one thing you can do with that index finger is actually mute your low strings from ringing out. So you can do those nice rake strokes, uh, getting up to your note without getting coming across the note that you're trying to sustain out. So if you hit this, see that index is kind of muting those low strings. And then uh, this move, this next move, continue on climbing up the neck is a little bit tough and I had to wrestle with this one a lot because it does require using your ring finger by itself to do a pretty tricky whole step bend and, and try to get those pitches correct. So this is the actual move. So it starts on the 21st fret and then you're going to bend up a whole step. See that middle finger right there? That guy is usually the one supporting that bend. So you have to let go while you still got that note up in the air to make this phrase sound how I recorded it. So it's... That's the general technique there. So it happens pretty fast, but that might be one you have to work on a little bit. I know still for me sometimes that's a struggle to get quite right. And then the last note, we're going to bend up with that ring finger. So I'm going to switch. And then I'll switch fingers get that nice sustain. So that last phrase sounds like this. Okay, so since I've got the Pro Tools rig set up behind me, I figured I'll just play the studio tracks, I'll mute the actual solo, and I'll just play it live.
So right now we're going to dive into a song called Let the Praises Ring, and I'm going to take you through the rhythm parts first, and then we'll move on to the solo. So this song starts with uh, kind of a figure that's a melodic figure that establishes a bit of a theme for the song up front. And uh, I'm using the octave technique that we've used in one of the other songs. And uh, again, so that's, if you start on the A string or the E string, you can just move up two frets and skip a string. So we're on E, which is a seventh fret, A string. And then we're on the G string, which is ninth fret, G string. So that's the first piece. And then we're just gonna move that around and form this melody from the beginning. It sounds like this. You'll hear me doing is I'm letting the low E string ring out, so I get a little bit of tension in those chords. So right here, kind of a major seven feel, but it's but it doesn't ring out too long. So uh, again, the figure goes, and those are all down strokes on my pick. So if you watch my picking hand, it's just like this. Another thing I'm adding in there just for a little bit of feel, and this is something you can play with as you go, uh, especially playing with some kind of metronome or drum machine, is I put a little, this has a rhythmic feature, so it's, there's a little upstroke in there. Then the next figure goes like this, starts on the sixth fret. And again, you're letting the low E string ring out. So you're strumming all those strings. And that's just a slide up and down on the last one. So sixth fret, slide up to the seventh fret. Then you're gonna downstroke and slide from the seventh to the ninth and back down. So like this. figure up to that point is and then the other one is a little bit tougher because you have to slide up kind of high and uh, measuring this out can be a little tricky I've definitely messed this up a few times live but it just takes a little practice to get it accurate so the second phrase or the third phrase rather goes like this so you're gonna be on the seventh fret with your index finger, ninth fret with your pinky in that octave shape. Up to the 14th fret. And then down to the ninth fret. And remember we talked about that muting technique where your index finger, if you look at my index finger, again is muting that D string to make that. I'm only getting those two notes. And that's just making a little harmonic. And then the next phrase is like this. It starts on the 12th fret, index finger, 11th fret. So the whole phrase, played slow, sounds like this. up to tempo with all the little rhythmic things in it, it sounds like this. And then we just repeat that twice at the beginning of the song and in the turnarounds. So the next thing we're going to take a look at with Let the Praises Ring is the verse. And just like with Everlasting God, it really depends on your band setup um, in terms of how you approach this from a part standpoint. So. If you have an acoustic player and an electric player, keys and drums, um, I'll kind of start there and give you my approach. And then if you've got another guitar player, there's some other stuff that you can do that I'll show you in a little bit. So um, the big thing is holding this chord, which is basically just a two note E major chord. So it's low E, ring finger, seventh fret A string, and middle finger, sixth fret D string. So, so you're doing octave E's there then a major third. And then we talked about with Everlasting God that whenever you take a major third and you lift it by a half step, that's a fourth, that's called a sus. So you're going to go E, and then E sus. And it just goes back and forth between those two. 
So it's oh Lord my God in you I put my trust you just keep going back and forth between those two and this is an important thing in terms of building the song dynamically but in the first half of the verse I don't do any rhythmic stuff so it's just a little vibrato okay that's the first half of the verse then the second half of the verse I'm gonna do the same thing with this chord here with these two but then the low E string is going to get a rhythmic pattern with the pick and again you don't have to duplicate this exactly of course but uh, I'll just show you what I do so it sounds like this one two three four now let me slow that figure down and you can check it out and when you combine those two together that'll give you a sense of lift for the second half of the verse so if you put them together I'll do half of each so it goes like this basic feel for those two sections and one other thing to note is uh, I've, I've actually heard people do this song before and when they get to the second half of the verse they take the dynamic level as high as the chorus and you don't want to do that you want to look at it as stair-stepping what I call it so you kind of start here and then maybe the second half of the verse goes up to there and then the chorus you always want to leave room to really take it up there and that'll give you a sense of lift when you get to the chorus. As another option for a rhythm part in the verse of Let the Praises Ring, I'm going to show you a technique you can use with a delay that'll create a really cool texture. And this also works great if you're playing in a band with two guitar players. Because if you stack up the exact same part on top of itself, sometimes it can sound a little bit busy or washy. So this is one uh, that one player can do, the other player can do the other part that I showed you. So uh, one thing you got to make sure is that you have a delay. And I've got one built into my Pod X3 Live, so uh, I'll turn that delay on, and it's set to a quarter note triplet on the tempo of the song. So that's a real important thing, and it's also important that your drummer plays to a click if you're going to use this, because if he gets off tempo, the delay won't sync up anymore. The other piece is that the mix on the delay is set to at least 50%. I actually think I have mine set even a little beyond 50%, just so that the repeat is a hair louder than the original note. So. so what this allows me to do is play a part like this. And then if I add the delay to it, it does this. It's a very simple technique, but it creates a great feel. And then there's one other thing that I did on the recording of Let the Praises Ring that I'll show you. That's another color you can add to it if you want to. So the part on that song sounds something like this in the verse. So the one piece is going on. When this piece comes on in the background. up with your own part you can walk all over scales with these if you want to so you can do the other thing you can do to add a really nice texture to this is actually kick the wah on and then kind of shape it with the wah and make it sound like this So you can do 
some things like that just to give it a little different color. And so I've got a wah pedal on the recorded version of Let the Praises Ring on that delay part. If you listen to the studio version, you can hear it tucked in there. So that's another verse option, uh, just a different texture for Let the Praises Ring. Let's move on to the chorus of Let the Praises Ring. And uh, you'll find this chorus is actually pretty simple to play, but I'm gonna use some kind of unorthodox chord voicings in here. And these are chord voicings you'll be able to use in other songs that you're playing. And uh, I think they just have a cool, uh, big sound to them. They ring out real nicely. So the first chord of the chorus is a B5, but I'm actually gonna use it as a sus where I'm gonna let the high E string ring out on this chord. So it's B, which is second fret A string, then ring finger on fourth fret D string and pinky fourth fret G string. And then I'm gonna let the B ring out open there. So. But then I'm going to hit the high E, which is going to make it a sus. Just like that. Then we're going to move up that exact same shape, just two frets. So your index finger then will be on the fourth fret, ring finger and pinky on the sixth fret. And then that's going to give you uh, a C sharp voicing that has a minor seven in it, which is the B. So you'll notice what these two chords have in common is the, the B and the E are going to ring out on both chords. So just a different. Now the E is going to serve the purpose of the minor third on the C sharp chord. So if you go, that's E there. It's a minor third. So, so you've got a minor third and a minor 7. So technically this is a C-sharp minor 7, but just a strange voicing of it. So. And then we're going to do a chord called an A2. And the voicing on this chord is open A, index finger, second fret, D string. And then I'm going to use my pinky, and you certainly can use your ring finger if you'd like, but pinky on fourth fret, G string. And again, we're going to let the B and the E ring out. So you're going to get a pattern of the B and the E ringing out over all these chords. And uh, it's just kind of a cool feel. It goes. Then the next chord we're going to use is an E sus. So it's a standard E chord, E major chord. So your low E rings out, open. Middle finger, second fret A string, which is a B note. Ring finger, second fret D string, which is an E octave and then index finger on first fret G string, which is going to offer the major third there. And remember, if we want to suss that, we just bring that up a half step on the G string. So the major third lifts like that, up to the A note, and then back down. So when we get up to that, the figure feels like this. I like to do in between going up to that sus is do an upstroke on the high E and, and B string like this. So creates a little phrase there. So the whole thing sounds like this. sharp minor seven chord and then down to the B B sus there and then the A2 I lift up holy hands and sing and then we're just gonna do a little slide off of the B and these kind of things can add just a nice little flavor but instead of just going we're gonna go just a little slide off so again if you look at that on the fretting hand instead of just just do a little slide off you don't get much but and then one other thing that helps with that is when you look at the picking hand, we talked about that muting technique in the verse of Everlasting God. You can use that here as well when you do these slides off. Just kind of hold the string so that you don't get, you don't get that going on. So, um, And then one last thing I want to point out to you. Um, if you watch the picking hand, I'm doing kind of a triplet pattern on this. 
Uh, so it's on that on that uh, phrasing. So and then basically it's just striking the D and sometimes both both the D and the G together. So and then it's so A string D string. slide off. Then the very last part, uh, and this is kind of an optional line, so that's why I waited till last to show it to you. And this is something that's cool to work with your drummer on, and you can play this line together. But uh, in you, in you, I find my piece, we do the first three chords, then do it again. Then on the third one, but we're going to go in you, and then third phrase. So you're going to go up to the C sharp minor 7 and then you're going to use the octave technique which is just you're going to go up to 6th fret and then 7th fret. So let me play the whole thing in time and then you can kind of feel the context for that. And there's a little drum beat change if you listen on the record that kind of punches those with the band. So it'll be a little variation on the chorus which makes it a little bit more interesting. So now that we've taken a look at the verse, chorus, and intro of Let the Praises Ring, let's go ahead and take a look at the solo. And before we get into this, um, I want to share with you a couple of things that I thought were kind of funny. When this first came out on the Amaze CD, it was a studio recording, and I had a lot of people sending me emails and, and commenting live that they thought that I used a delay or did some kind of trick to do this solo. And I think you'll find that as I show you the technique, it's pretty simple. And it sounds much more difficult than it is, so that's the good news. This is also one of those solos that uh, employs a lot of alternate picking, and so it applies on the rule of if you play it slow and accurate, you'll just get faster at this as you go. And uh, so we're going to dive right in, and uh, I'll take you through just one step at a time, very slowly, and I think you'll find this will come together pretty quickly. So it starts with ring finger on the 12th fret high E string on a down stroke with the pick and then we're going to go an up stroke in a middle finger 11th fret high E string and then down stroke ring finger again 12th fret and then the fourth note of every phrase of this solo is high E and an up stroke with the pick so the picking pattern kind of comes in groups of fours. The second phrase, you're going to do your ring finger on the seventh fret, and then your index finger to the fifth fret, back again, ring finger to the seventh fret, and then open, which will be an upstroke. So that one looks like this. So if we put those two phrases together, it looks like this. The third phrase of the solo, you're going to use your ring finger on the ninth fret, then down to your index finger on the seventh fret, and then back up. So you'll notice there's kind of a pattern here that these all alternate. And just so I can give you a little glimpse inside my head, what I was thinking when I wrote this solo was I wanted to write something that was a Celtic feel. Um, and had a real syncopated nature to it. So you'll probably hear that as this solo begins to unfold. So, And then again, ninth fret, ring finger, seventh fret, index finger on an upstroke. And then back to the ninth fret, ring finger, downstroke. And then an open with the upstroke. 
Then we're going to move down to the fifth fret with the middle finger, fourth fret, index finger, upstroke, and then back again to the middle finger with the downstroke, and then an upstroke on the high E. So. Then we're going to move up again to the two phrases ago. It's just a repeat of that phrase. So it's ring finger, seventh fret, index finger, fifth fret, back up, and then an open with an upstroke. So let's take phrases one through five and we'll put them together. And I'll just play through them very slowly so we can see how that's coming together up to that point. Do that one more time. Let's move on to the sixth phrase. That's going to be ring finger and the index finger, starting on the fourth fret, going down to the second fret, back up to the fourth, and then again an open on the high E upstroke. Then the seventh phrase is ring finger to middle finger, and then back to ring finger on the fifth and fourth frets. And the eighth phrase is a little bit different than the other ones, but really no more difficult to play. You're going to start on the second fret with your index finger. Then you're going to go an upstroke on the high E, which is open, and then repeat that. And then ring finger, fourth fret, and then again an upstroke on the high E. One more time on that. So if we take all of that in just one fell swoop here. Again, we'll do it slowly. Now, I want you to take a look at my picking hand as we run through this this time. And you'll notice that alternate picking is just a key part of this solo. So uh, let's do these real slowly. But you'll notice it's just back and forth, back and forth, very even. And uh, so let's take a look at this. It's all alternate picking so far. And it's going to stay like that almost to the very end of the solo. OK, so continuing on with the solo, we're going to start with the ninth phrase. And you're going to use the same pattern, but the rhythmic phrase is a slightly different. So the accents are on different notes. So if you'll notice where we started the pattern before, it's a 16th note pattern, but it starts before the downbeat. So if we counted it off slowly, it's one, two, three, four. Okay, so if you're counting 1E and a 2E and a 3E and a 4E and a 1, it starts on the AND of 4. So 1 and a 2E and a 3E and a 4E. Okay, that's how the phrasing of the first part works. Now, starting on phrase 9, they actually start on the downbeats rather than on the AND of 4. So as we get to that, let's take phrase 8, for, in, for instance. So that's actually a downbeat this time. OK, so let's start with phrase 8, and I'll count that off. And then you'll see when I switch to phrase 9, it rotates to a downbeat on the accent. So uh, if I count it off, 1, 2, 3. That's the phrasing of the last, or of phrase 8, rather. So 1e e and a 2e e and a 3e. E. That's where phrase 9 starts, so it's on a downbeat. So all those climb phrases that we're going to do all are on downbeats. So it's one, two, three, four. So let me show you those slowly and in detail. So the first phrase right there of that climb, which is phrase nine, is ring finger to index finger, back up, and then again high E on an up, uh, upstroke. And you're going to go fourth fret, second fret, fourth fret, and then an upstroke. 
then ring finger to middle, starting on the fifth fret at a half step interval. Again. Then you're going to go seventh fret to fifth fret to seventh fret using ring finger and middle. And then ninth fret to seventh fret back to the ninth fret. Let's try just those phrases. And just one more time on that. And then the last part of the first half of the solo is Let's break that down. Ring finger, 12th fret, high E string, downstroke, and then open E, upstroke, and then index finger, 7th fret, downstroke, and then high E, open, on an upstroke, and then ring finger, 9th fret, on a downstroke, and then high E again with the upstroke, and then 5th fret, index finger, and then high E on an upstroke, noticing a pattern here. And then a ring finger, 7th fret, and then again high E upstroke. And then index finger, 4th fret. And then high E upstroke. And then ring finger, 7th fret, as the last note. So I'll play that real slow. So let's take all of that so far, and we'll take it at a slow tempo, but we'll play all the way through phrase one, all the way up the climb, and then through that last phrase. Now the good news is, as we continue on to the second half of the solo, you're going to repeat the first part. So after we do that last phrase, then on the studio version, we do the same climb up. And then I'll show you that last lick. And then on the live version, I do it just slightly different. And so uh, I'm going to play you the live version up to tempo, and then I'll break it down uh, at a slower speed. So let's just take one more look at those triplet phrases. And again, this is just an option. So I didn't do this you know, for on the studio version, but I did do it on the live version. I still do this when I play it live, but I use the studio version's last phrase, which I'll show you in just a second. So again, downstroke. Just practice that slowly, and the speed will come with time. And then on the studio version, one more time, we just play the standard climb that's the same thing as what we started with phrase nine with on the downbeat. And then I'm going to start with the easier of the two, which is the one I played on the live version uh, for no particular reason. I just thought it was kind of a nice ending phrase. And it went like this. 
that very ending run actually has kind of a strange time figure to it. And again, this is something you can feel out and make, make your own. Uh, sometimes I play things a little off kilter in terms of the phrasing of it. And so uh, if there are things that don't feel natural for you, it's much better to play a, play a part that feels just natural that you can really dig your teeth into and make your own. So this is the way that I did it. So it's that triplet phrase. So these kind of are on what we call pushes. One more time. A lot of that alternate picking after that series of pull-offs. Nice vibrato on the end. So that phrase up to tempo sounds like this. Now the version that I used on the studio album uh, has a hammer-on pull-off combination. Starts with a downstroke, and you're going to use uh, uh, these guys up here. Now sometimes you can use your ring finger and your pinky. Sometimes you can use your middle finger and your ring finger. Just again, whatever feels comfortable to you. So on this particular riff, I use the middle finger and the ring finger. That's the first lick. So on a downstroke, hammer on with the ring finger up there on the, what are we at there, 17th fret. And then a pull off from the middle finger to the index finger, which is 16th down to the 14th fret. So then we kind of take the riff a little bit further. So we're going to go downstroke, hammer on, pull off, and then a downstroke on the ring finger, 17th fret B string. And then we're going to go an upstroke on the index finger, 14th fret. So let's take it that far. Of a cool technique. You can use this in all different kinds of ways. You can repeat that phrase if you want in certain solos. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in another one of the solos. So to take that phrase the next step, I'm going to play the, the whole thing that we can kind of see where we're headed and then I'll break it down piece by piece. So we've just got that first bit that we talked about. And the next step is this. kind of where we're headed. I'll slow that down just a little bit more. And this is kind of a morphed version that isn't exactly what I did in the studio, but this is what I tend to do live now. So again, it doesn't have to be note for note, just something that works for you. So once we get past that first section that we broke down, we're going to go that middle finger there, and that's an upstroke on the pick, that's a pull off there. And you use your middle finger on the 16th fret G string. Watch the picking pattern there. Okay, so before I play the whole solo up to speed and with the rest of the music, I want to explain a couple of things about the sound that I used. Uh, now, I talked a little bit on the prior solo about how I used my bridge pickup wired to my rear tone pot. And uh, for this solo, 
I definitely roll this thing back quite a bit, sometimes even down as far as four, and then I'll kick on like an overdrive. So I use a Boss OD3 sometimes, and I'll show you the settings on that later, but it'll give a little more punch to the solo. Another thing that's real important with this song, as you've probably gathered by now, is with all the alternate picking, playing with a real consistent tempo or meter is just real important. So uh, you hear in this type of sound. And again, with that idea of this solo being very syncopated, kind of Celtic by nature, uh, it's a good idea to practice this with a metronome or a drum machine to where you, know, you can slow it down and set it at a tempo that works for you to play it completely accurately and correctly. And this is one that is just a no-brainer to gain speed as you play it accurately. So. Whatever the tempo you need to play it at. And believe it or not, this is one that I've gotten faster and faster at over the years, just playing it over and over again. So you can even, you know. And it's, it, it, it looks and sounds much harder than it really is. So one more time. So if you just keep working that over and over again, and that speed will come with time. So let me go ahead and solo the drums up and I'll play a little bit along with that just for a consistent meter. And this is something that you can do, just play this. Get your picking hand really dialed in. You get the idea. It's just really playing something that's got a consistent meter and gives you a sense for the song uh, when you're practicing to get this thing really dialed in. So now I'm going to play along with these tracks. I'll mute the solo that's on the live tracks and I'll play it live for you right now. All right, so here we go. You can do a little slide going into it if you want to. And that's how you play Let the Praises Ring solo.